Hello, hello, hello. And hi to all of you who are on live stream. It's great to be with you. Before we do anything else, for those of you here in Los Angeles, and for those of you who are elsewhere, if this applies, please introduce yourselves to the people who are around you, to your right, to your left, in front of you, and behind you. Okay, you all ready? All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Please join with me. Let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now, it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here in this sacred place we are gathered, brought together by the power and into the presence of God. We dedicate our time spent together, all of our relationships with one another to him. May his holiest spirit be upon us, reaching down into every thought and every feeling we have, that we might thus be lifted above and beyond the sorrows and the limitations and the fears of this world to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is together. We all say, Amen. <clears throat> Tonight, I'd like to talk about the basic principles of A Course in Miracles. Now, for those of you who have been doing the course for a long time, perhaps even many years, you know that this is not something that should upset you and make you feel, oh, I'm past that. I have a friend, uh, after many years, we still laugh about the fact that when I first met him, and uh, I asked him something, he said, oh, I, I, I did the Course in Miracles, and I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm past that. Years later, he, he joked a lot. We, we, we share a laugh about that. Um, the basic principles of A Course in Miracles and the advanced principles of A Course in Miracles are not different principles. When you advance spiritually, you do not become more metaphysically complicated. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite of becoming more metaphysically complicated. A Course in Miracles, the basic principles of the Course, are actually very simple. And they are not in and of themselves difficult. He says in the Course, these ideas are not difficult, they are very different. What is difficult is getting over our resistance, and that can be very fierce. Fierce resistance to practicing and embodying the principles, but the principles themselves are simple enough. A Course in Miracles says complexity is of the ego, and we will talk about that a little bit later. So when you are dealing with an advanced student, as we like to become, we begin as beginning students and intermediate students and advanced students of something like the Course in Miracles, is not dealing with principles that are any different than the principles that the beginning student is learning. The advancement lies in, I actually practiced it, even in this situation that's so complicated, even in this situation where I am so invested, even in this situation where the appearances seem so contrary to what in my heart I know to be true. I practiced it. So when we talk about how we're going to go over the uh, beginning principles of A Course in Miracles, the basic principles of A Course in Miracles, I assure you, whether you're doing the course for 30 years or for uh, 30 minutes, the, the principles are the same. Let's start with the book itself. The Course in Miracles is not a religion. There is no doctrine and there is no dogma. 
All three volumes, there are three volumes. Volume one is called the text. That's the intellectual basis of The Course in Miracles. It's something like 600 and some odd pages. This is not the kind of book that you read a couple chapters before you go to bed. This is the kind of book that, you know, a paragraph can kind of boggle your mind for the next day or two. And there's nothing in The Course in Miracles about how fast you read this. The only thing that it does say about the text is that you do read it from the beginning to the end. It actually says at a certain place, if you do the end sooner than the beginning, the experience may become more traumatic than beatific. So the one thing that The Course in Miracles does say is whatever book you're reading, you read it from the beginning. Now, the second book is the volume two, and that is the workbook for students. Now, the workbook for students is the crux of the material. Why is that? It's because the volume one is what gives you an intellectual understanding of what all this is about. But the Course in Miracles says that enlightenment begins as abstract concept and then takes a journey without distance and that journey without distance is from I understand it intellectually, I understand it abstractly, to, wow, I was, I, I, I was actually non-reactive when I had that conversation. Wow, I was actually generous and I wasn't just so thinking about myself that I didn't consider their feelings or whatever it is. That you actually, the journey is to the actualization of the principles. So the principles, is we study them, we learn them, that's certainly in the, in the text, in the text. But in the workbook is where the mind is trained. And that's what The Course in Miracles calls itself. It is a mind training. It is a training of the mind to think along the lines that the text sets forth. Much like when you work your muscles in yoga or weight training, you are retraining your muscles. And by the way, a lot of that involves resisting gravity. Well, the same with internal weight training. You are resisting psychological gravity. You're resisting emotional gravity. You're resisting the thoughts that would pull you down. And the thoughts that pull you down into an attachment to dense materialization on the planet and the interpretation of events which that mental filter gives you then takes you into a downward pull emotionally. So just like you train your outer muscles, you train your inner ones. Now, with volume two, there is a page and a half, which is an introduction to the workbook. And the workbook is 365 days worth of lessons. And these lessons, in the first half of the year, it is a dismantling of the thought system of the world, which is a thought system based on fear. And in the second half, the second six months, is the rebuilding, substituting that old thought system with a new one, which is a thought system based on love. I wish I could tell you that once you've done 365 days, then you're an enlightened master and you're, you're done. It doesn't work that way. It's like with physical exercise. You never get to stop. You, ne you never get to look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh, that's good. I don't ever have to pick up a weight again, or I don't ever have to do yoga again. It's, it's, it's continuous, and so it is with A Course in Miracles as well. The third volume is called The Manual for Teachers, and it answers a lot of the questions that we have about different topics, and it's a much smaller volume. The question comes up for many people, which book do I read first? There is nothing in The Course in Miracles where it tells us which book to read first. Now, as I was just saying, it does say in, in, at the beginning of volume two, it does have a page and a half introduction to doing the workbook lessons. Some of you I know are downloading my uh, audio recordings of the workbook lessons, having them come into your um, inbox every day. Uh, you might have an app. There are all kinds of ways you can support yourself in actually uh, uh, doing the workbook. The Course in Miracles does suggest that we make an effort to go to this every day. Now, and the only thing, the, the only real direction here is to not do more than one a day. And, you know, if you missed, if you missed it, you missed it. You know, the, the last thing The Course in Miracles wants to be is a reason for you to feel guilty, because the whole thing in The Course is, is to get rid of guilt. So the last thing The Course would want to be is another reason for you to feel guilty about anything, which is why sometimes we just support each other and just, like, lighten up, because that, that heaviness does not help. I should do this. I should do that. The Course in Miracles is the last thing it would want to be is one more should on your list, right? So a lot of times when people are doing the workbook of The Course, You'll, you'll find yourself staying more than one day on an exercise because you feel like you didn't really get it. Well, as I said before, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life anyway. But also, 
just for me personally and most people I know, if after three days, I, I'm, I, I can't really honestly say it, just I breathed it, drank it in at the deepest level, that's okay, go on to the next one. But that's personal, you might feel like you want to stay longer, but beware because if you stay too long, then I think you'll start losing your interest, sort of. But that's really up to you. The issue about which book to do first, which book to do first is completely up to you. There's nothing in the Course telling you which one you should read first. When I first read The Course in Miracles, I naturally, I, I was naturally moved to read the text and to do the workbook at the same time. That really worked for me because the text was explaining to me what the philosophy was that I was trying to train myself to think with, and the workbook was actually helping me get there. And then once again, because you're told the speed with which to try to go along, you know, i.e., try to keep it up once a day if you can, and then actually in some of them it tells you what to do five times a day or whatever, and then the text you just read at your own, at your own pace, right? And I think that's all I have to say about the actual doing of, uh, of the workbook exercises. Okay, now what does the course say? The Course in Miracles, as I said, not a religion, no dogma, no doctrine. And it says that it is based on universal spiritual themes. One of the scribes of the Course in Miracles once referred to it as a Christian Vedanta. It uses traditional Christian terms, and it's very Buddhist in feel. And it's Jewish in delivery, so, uh, you know. <laughs> Everything uh, you will recognize, you know, are one of the things that's very exciting about any deep study of mysticism. Mysticism is not a religion, it is a path of the heart. And there are the mystical core universal themes at the heart of all the great religious, spiritual, and philosophical systems. So whether it's Buddhism or the Kabbalah or uh, the Bible or the Quran or AA, you know, you say, oh, right, I, I know that principle. And that's, that's kind of beautiful because that actually fortifies your faith, this great kaleidoscope of spiritual and um, philosophical and religious understanding. Some people find these, these truths uh, within the context of organized religious systems. Some people do not. The Course in Miracles says that the students uh, and, and the teachers will under, well, explain about t students and teachers come from all religions and no religions. When you get the Course in Miracles, it actually has now as part of the Foundation for Inner Peace publication of it, it actually has what used to be a separate pamphlet on how it came. And the story of the writing is quite extraordinary, actually. Okay, now, the introduction. This is what I first saw when I first saw The Course in Miracles, what made me both attracted to it and made me put it down. <clears throat> you open this book, and it's in, it says, Introduction. This is a course in miracles. Now, it's interesting because in this first sentence, it doesn't capitalize anything. It just says, this is a course in miracles. Notice that The Course in Miracles does not say, The Course in Miracles. It is a Course in Miracles. It does not ever claim any monopoly on truth. It is just one statement of universal spiritual themes. This is a Course in Miracles. And then the second sentence is, it is a required course. Now what book, and then I remember going like this. <laughs> Who wrote this thing? And there is no author. This is a Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. That one sentence is one of the many great sentences from the, without, throughout world literature, which is now all over the internet attributed to Rumi. Um, <laughs> this course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course 
can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Now that introduction contains it all. And then at the very beginning of chapter 1 of the text are the 50 principles of miracles, which are absolutely mind-blowing, actually. And it's like one will kind of just like, whoa, okay. So let's start with this introduction. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Notice that it also says the opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So this is what the Course in Miracles says. Love is real. And the Course in Miracles talks about real with a capital R, and then it talks about real with a little r. The Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. That is beyond what can be taught. So the Course isn't here to tell you what love means or what love is. But it is telling you that it is everything. The Course in Miracles says that you are an idea in the mind of God. You are an idea in the mind of God. God, or love, is all that is. Nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. God is love, is real. It cannot be threatened. Means it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be modified, it cannot be diminished, it cannot be changed in any way. God is perfect love. You are an idea in the mind of God, and the Course in Miracles tells us that an idea does not leave its source. Now, I want to stay with that one for just a second. You are an idea in the mind of God, and an idea cannot leave its source, which is, number one, why you cannot be separate from from God. It's also why when you project blame and guilt onto another person, you will always ending, end up feeling angrier and more guilty because it boomerangs back to you. You can project it onto another person, but an idea doesn't leave its source. So as long as you have the idea of their guilt in your mind, you will end up feeling guiltier. I don't want to go into that any more than to say that, but it begins to make you understand that these principles of your relationship to God and the universe form the template that informs you how to live happily on this planet with other people. And the fact that we don't know how to live on this planet happily quite often, the fact that we don't know how to live happily with other people quite often is because we have lost our conscious contact, as they call it in AA, are rooting with that primary, primal relationship with God. You are an idea in the mind of God. You are, therefore, not a body. Your body is a suit of clothes. The Course in Miracles says physical birth was not the beginning of your life, it's a continuation of your life. Physical death is not the end of your life, it is the continuation of your life. Now, Millions of years ago, in time as we know it, although in reality it never happened at all. That's how the Course puts it. Millions of years ago, in time as we know it, but in reality it never happened at all. Now before I explain this, go back to this sentence. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. Remember, what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. Love can have no opposite. Millions of years ago, in time as you know it, although in reality it never happened at all, the, the mind of man, the mind of the human, which is actually an idea and the thought of God, took what in the Course in Miracles is called a detour into fear. This is the exile from the Garden of Eden right here. This is what the Course in Miracles calls the separation. And it is described in the Course as the moment when the Son of God forgot to laugh. There was a moment, and I, I find that fascinating because that totally aligns with the theory of the Big Bang. When, you, when science talks about how this all happened in an instant, the Course says that this all happened in an instant. That there was an instant 
millions of years ago in time as we know it, but in reality, it never happened at all. So what's this in reality, it never happened at all? Well, nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. So if I had a thought that was separate from God, i.e. I had a thought that was non-loving, that's to the, that's the say the same thing. If I talk about I did this without God, is the same thing as I did this without loving thought. And if I did it with hateful thought, no matter how much I'm talking about God, I didn't do it with God. Right? God shall not be mocked, the Course says, means he isn't. So in that moment that we began to think without love, because what is all-encompassing can have no opposite, and because only love is real, in that moment when we began to think without love, the Course says we actually were not thinking at all. We began hallucinating. And the Course in Miracles says that this entire mortal plane that we are experiencing is a giant hallucination. And the Course in Miracles calls it an illusion. Once again, very Buddhist in feel. This is exactly what Buddha says. Now, free will. Remember it says here, free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. Free will means I can think whatever I want to think. That means free will. I can think whatever I want to think. However, the Course in Miracles says that the building block, and I don't think, that's, I don't think it uses the expression building block, but a law that God created, which in terms of the psychology of the Course is like a building block, is the law of cause and effect. In the East, they call it karma, Buddhist feeling, in the West, cause and effect. And it means that every thought, the Course says, creates form on some level. So this entire three-dimensional plane is an outpicturing of our thoughts. So I can think whatever I want to think, and I will then experience as an effect, the cause of which is my thinking, the experience of life called forth by my thought. The Course in Miracles says the law of cause and effect was set up for our protection. It's set up for our protection, meaning if I think only with love, I'll be fine. But God himself, once God creates something, the Course says God will not uncreate it. That's why you can't die. That's why you can't be uncreated. That would, un, nothing unreal exists and nothing real can be threatened. The law of cause and effect is inviolable. So you cannot say to God, I really want to be happy, but I want to hold on to the thoughts that cause my unhappiness. Because God himself will not violate the law of cause and effect. What you do is you ask God to help you change your thinking. So what went down here? We began to think thoughts millions of years ago, although in reality it never occurred at all, in this hallucination, where we began thinking without love. And because that which is thought without love is then experienced without love, thereby creating chaos and suffering. That is the root of suffering. Okay? Now, in that moment, God, theologically, theoretically, philosophically here, God number one, is not going to violate free will. He's not going to say, you can't do that. Because the whole point is that because you are an idea in the mind of God, the Course in Miracles says all of the attributes of God are in you. The only difference between you and God is that he created you, but you did not create him. Although we have created a God in our image, and that's this notion of an angry God. But it's a fiction. So God was not going to say, no, you can't do that. Love does not force. So the Course in Miracles says, however, that God does create the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs, because God is infinite love. So God's driving along in happiness and peace. I'm driving along in happiness and peace, and this moment comes where I separate from loving thought. Why? Because I can. So what is God, which is the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs, going to do about that? Is he going to say, no, you don't bring me back? No. Free will means you can, 
do whatever you want to do. But what he did do, the Course in Miracles says, in that moment, because God creates the answer to every problem the moment the problem exists, is that he created in our mind a friend. And this friend goes by many names. In A Course in Miracles, it is called the internal teacher. In Christic philosophical terms, it is called the Holy Spirit. The Course in Miracles refers to it as the comforter. The Course in Miracles refers to it as a bridge of perception, the gentle transformer of perception, a term not used in the Course but used in the Urantia book that I find fascinating is thought adjuster. So that means I'm in a situation and I'm in pain. And I say, I know I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm in pain. Got that. Why am I in pain? Well, the ego mind, and we'll talk about what the ego is in a moment, says, well, I'm in pain because of what she said. I'm in pain because of what he did, obviously. The Course in Miracles says, no, you are in pain because how you are, of how you are interpreting what she said and how you are interpreting what he did. It is not what is happening that is causing you pain because if it's not love, it's not even happening. And this gets very Buddhist here. It is your attachment to what is happening that is causing you pain. And why are you attached to it? Because you think it's real. Now, the mind that, so you have, it is though the mind is split in two. One part of the mind is eternally connected to God, and it sees everything in terms of love, and it cannot be destroyed. So think about a time when you're having a fight with someone you love, and one of both of you says, this, this is not happening. Actually, it's not. One of both of you says, it's like a fucking nightmare, because it is. <laughs> right? So one part of your mind is clear about that, but this is the problem. We are living on a planet. Once again, this happened millions of years ago in time as we know it. The Course in Miracles says, in the Bible it says that Adam fell asleep. Nowhere does it say that he woke up. So planetary consciousness, human consciousness, the Course in Miracles just refers to it as the Son of God, fell asleep. And in this state of dreaming, nightmares came. Now, in this sleep state, hallucination, illusion, we forgot who we are. I forgot, when I separated from God, I forget, I forgot, and then every moment I reenact this craziness, I forget again my oneness with God. The Course in Miracles likens this <clears throat> to a sunbeam to the sun, thinking it's separate from other sunbeams. It is like a wave in the ocean thinking it is separate from other waves. Now, think about how different your psychological and emotional perspective and experience of a situation is depending on which of those two you're aligned with. If I think I'm just one wave in the ocean and I'm separate from all the other waves, how can I not be terrified of the ocean? How could I not feel in any given moment I'm going to be engulfed by the other waves? It, I, I'm just one little wave, and it's this huge ocean. How could I not live in constant fear? On the other hand, if I realize, I'm one with the whole thing. I move. It moves. <laughs> That's how powerful I am. Can't be separated from the whole thing. There is nothing to fear. And yet we are like the wave, thinking we're separate from other Waves, we are like the sunbeams thinking that we are separate from other sunbeams, which, once again, the wave could only hallucinate that it's separate. The sunbeam could only hallucinate that it's separate. Now, the mind is as split in two. One part of the mind is just grooving along, knowing all that's happening here is I love you and you love me, and that's all that's happening, and everything is endless love and peace and fabulousness. But a very, very long time ago, a mindset developed. And this mindset now prevails within human consciousness. And it is the mindset which is not, this is the, the point, it's not neutral. 
Every thought is so powerful because it is the power of the universe behind every thought you think. So if our thoughts are thoughts of love, i.e. aligned with God, because that's who we are and what we're to do here, which is that the thoughts of love are coming into us and then I'm extending it outward. To that extent, I am being who I really am. My mind is being used for the purpose that it was created to be used. And then, as the Course says, you are here on this earth to create the good, the holy, and the beautiful. I'm certainly, to the best of our ability, taking each day, and as the Course says, you pray, Dear God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say into home? All I want to do today is remember I am one with love and be an extension of love. To that extent, you are aligned with the thinking that will produce peace for you and others. If, however... My mind is at the effect of the mindset which dominates this world and which we are taught from the time we are very, very small. It is a thought system that is not dominated by love. It is a thought system that is dominated by fear. Once again, the Course says the opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So from the time we're very young, we are taught the, the thought system of fear to the point where at a very early age, natural loving thought feels unnatural to us. And unnatural thought actually feels more natural. It actually feels more natural to judge. It feels more natural to defend. It feels more natural to attack. It feels more natural to find guilt. It feels more t- natural to separate ourselves. And so enlightenment is not a learning, it is an unlearning. It is an unlearning of the thought system that dominates the world. The way the word ego is used in the Course in Miracles, ego means, and this, it, sometimes it's used differently in a lot of different psychological systems. The way the Course in Miracles uses the word ego is the way the ancient Greeks used it. It's the idea, and remember it's a false idea, it is a delusion of the small separated self. The ego is the belief that I am that separate wave. It is the belief that I am separate from you. Now what is the ego's biggest support for this delusion, my physical senses. Because the ego is the belief that I'm over here and you're over there. It is the belief that I am my body and you are yours. And that is how I'm able to believe I'm separate from you. Now, on the level of the body within this three-dimensional plane, which is the hallucination, you are over there and I'm over here. Einstein said time and space are just illusions of consciousness. So my physical eyes tell me you're over there. My physical ears tell me you're over there. But the Course in Miracles points out your physical senses lie all the time. You, you see an airplane take off, and the further away it gets, your eyes would tell you it gets smaller. It doesn't actually get smaller. So the, the ego says that you are your body. And enlightenment is a shift in self-perception from body identification to spirit identification from the belief that I am my body to belief that I am my spirit. Now, just even taking that right there, obviously, talk about an, an example of something where, okay, I can get that intellectually, but actually taking that journey without distance from the head to my gut is a whole other story. Now, the Course in Miracles says that the ego mind, the, the spirit within you, has one goal, and that is your happiness and everybody else's. The purpose of your life is to be happy. Because when you remember who you are, and you are aligned with what your purpose is on this planet, you cannot but be happy. The ego is not neutral on this. You know how they say in AA about addiction, it is a sly and insidious and progressive disease. The ego is not just here to inconvenience you. Just like your alcoholism is not here to inconvenience you, If given the chance, it would like to kill you. And it doesn't want to just bring you down. It would like to bring the entire family unit down, if possible, as well. Well, that's a modern example of how ego operates. So the ego, the Course in Miracles says, is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. Because the mind is all-powerful. So when my mind is not given to love, it is still powerful. It is as powerful in its effects within this illusion as is the spirit. So if my mind is tuned to fear, it absolutely has in mind all manner of cruelty and 
craziness and war and conflict and disease and so forth. Now, as we'll talk about later, though, it's very interesting how the ego operates. It would rather you not have an outright nervous breakdown. Because you have an outright nervous breakdown, you might actually question what's going on here. So the ego just likes this like mild river of misery hanging out in the background of your experience and that you can just buy into the thought that, uh, you know, this is just normal and this is what it is to be alive. <laughs> and so the Course in Miracles says that the ego mind has a cornerstone belief and that is that the Son of God is guilty. And the Holy Spirit, which keeps you connected to the spiritual, which is the thoughts which produce inner peace, also has a cornerstone belief. And that is that the Son of God is innocent. And in every moment, in every human encounter, the ego mind would have you find fault with someone else or come up with some reason to distance yourself. And the Spirit would have you see the innocence in another person, and dwell within the relationship as a sacred encounter. Relationships are where it all goes down. The Course in Miracles says that there is no path to God separate from, separate from our path to each other. Like in the lyric in Les Miserables where it says, to love another person is to see the face of God. The Course in Miracles says that relationships then are heaven or relationships are hell. Every thought takes us to heaven or hell. But when the Course in Miracles talks about heaven or hell, remember, it uses these traditional Christian terms, but in decidedly non-traditional, <clears throat> psychological, metaphysical ways. Heaven is not a condition or a place. It's not about after we die. Heaven is an awareness of our oneness, which produces inner peace. Hell is the condition that the ego would make of every moment. So every moment, every thought we think takes us into peace or takes us into chaos. Now, when Jesus, for instance, was walking the earth, they, they didn't articulate things like depression, anxiety, jealousy, rage. They just went, hell. And when you're really in those places, you too, you do it. Say, this is hell. Because it is. That is what hell is. So the ego mind would have us analyze it. This is how I got this way, you know, mommy was this way, and daddy was that way, and if I analyze it enough, maybe I will figure it out, and all that. The Course in Miracles says that that's just a trick of the ego mind. That love, as it says in the introduction, what is all-encompassing can have no opposite, and the opposite of love is fear. You cannot turn on the light and have darkness remain, and you cannot turn on love and have fear remain. So the Course in Miracles is a training in the dismantling of a thought system based on fear and the acceptance instead of a thought system based on love. And every single morning, and I've, I've never known of any serious spiritual or religious or philosophical path that does not talk about the importance of the morning because the morning is when your mind is most open to new impressions. So if you wake up in the morning and you go directly to the internet, you go directly to <clears throat> your phone, you go directly to a newspaper, you go directly to the radio, and you are bombarded by this fear-based barrage of meaninglessness, frenetically delivered, that is called the modern world. And when we allow that, then we are already at the effect we are, we are just allowing the fear of the world to just pour itself into our consciousness. Now, you take a shower in the morning, you take a bath in the morning because you want to purify your body. You don't want to walk out into the world with yesterday's dirt on your body. But you might clean your body, but if you don't de-stress, if you don't let go the fear on your mind, then you might have a clean body, but your mind is still filled with fear. Now, the Holy Spirit that God placed in your mind, because God placed it in your mind, remember what God creates is created eternally. It has been placed in your mind. You can't get rid of it. It's there. And it has been authorized by God should you request it. This is, this is a big deal, your conscious request. You have free will. 
If you want to saunter into a situation and hold on to your interpretation, somebody's guilt, your guilt, you were victimized, they're bad, you're no good, or they're no good, or it, it, ain't it awful, or whatever it is, and you can probably find whole groups of people who will support you in that. You can. But the way of the course, he says, you are not asked to have no impure thoughts. You're only asked to have none that you would keep. What is an impure thought, a non-loving thought? So as a Course in Miracles student, we are trained to know, if I'm insane, how do I know I'm insane? Because I'm not happy. What is my ego mind? Oh, I'll tell you what would make me happy. If he, if he, if he would apologize, she would change her mind. I would get that money because you know it, it's mine and I deserve it. So the ego has all kinds of ideas about what should change on the material plane and then I will be happy. But the spirit says no. The issue is where you dwell within the situation because it's not what's actually happening that's causing you this pain anyway. It's your interpretation of what's happening. Now, a miracle is the shift in thinking the miracle is the shift in thinking from fear to love. So as Course in Miracles students, it's not like we're enlightened masters, but we are asked to get to the point of being willing to say, well, I feel bad, therefore, by definition, I'm insane. By definition, I'm not perceiving this correctly. I am willing to see this differently. That is basic principle in the Course in Miracles, that you are a choice what you think. That is basic in the Course. And as those of you who are doing the workbook know, those first parts of the, of the workbook are really amazing. This, this chair does not mean anything. This hand does not mean anything. This book does not mean anything. I give this book all the meaning it has. I give all, this wall all the meaning it has. It's a training in knowing that the entire material world is not what it appears to be. It is simply a construct outpictured to you. So the Course in Miracles says that as you give any situation to the Holy Spirit, to give a situation to the Holy Spirit means by definition, I give my thinking about this situation to the Holy Spirit. And the Course in Miracles says every situation is a relationship. So I give my thinking about this person. I give my thinking, and as we say here all the time, that what you put on the altar is then altered, right? Because to put it on the altar, the Course says the altar is in your mind. God is in your mind as you are in his. To put something on the altar means, dear God, I put the situation on the altar, which means I know that the only reason that this person and I even know each other is so that they get closer to enlightenment and I get closer to enlightenment, but I sure don't feel this way because they are completely triggering me. I can't tell you how much she's like my mother <laughs> or whatever, right? And this childhood wound is so deep and my trigger is so deep, I cannot get there by myself. Dear God, please help me. In that moment, because I have requested it, and if I had not requested it, it would not occur because it would be a violation of my free will, which God himself would not violate because he set up the law. If I say, I am willing to see this differently, dear God, please help me see this differently, then the Holy Spirit, the Course says, is authorized, fully authorized, to use every, every factor, heaven and earth. What does that mean? It could be a song lyric. It could be something you read, it could be a book, it could be something someone says. One of the things that I often find is how, you know, you're, you're going around and you're, you're trying to figure out something and you ask your friends and you read books and then you're with someone who you hardly know and it's the most casual encounter and they just happen to say something in passing and you go, oh my God, that was it. Have you ever had those experiences? Something's going to happen if you're alert. Once you all you have to know is the universe is perfect. God has the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs. So you don't have to go anywhere. You have to simply say, I am willing to see this differently. Now, as you do your course exercises, it's just like anything else when you work out. You work out your body so that you can move through the world very strongly. You work out your attitudinal musculature so that you can be non-reactive and not go crazy and not be hysterical and not get addictive and actually able to remain clear so that more clear, sober, meaningful thought can occur to you. The miracle, the Course says, is a divine intercession. It is a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own. And it reestablishes the celestial order. It, on this planet, the celestial order does not reign. In the thought system beyond this planet, 
which is where you actually belong, the celestial order of perfect peace does reign. And the problem on this planet is that we think that we are not who we really are, and we think that we are who we really are not. I think that I'm a separate being. I think that I'm separate from you. And the Course in Miracles says, you are heir to the laws that rule within the world you identify with. So if I identify with this world, then I am heir to the laws that rule here. And so enlightenment is a process by which I begin to not identify with this world. Now, the Course in Miracles does not say that this world is bad. It says that this world is nothing. This world is completely neutral. So it's almost as though we manufactured it but because God is in our mind, even this can be gorgeous. I mean, if you've ever hiked, if you've ever been in the wilderness, if you've ever been in the mountains, if you've ever looked at a flower, if you've ever looked at an infant, if you've ever fallen in love, no one needs to tell you this world can be gorgeous. And the Course in Miracles says it can be so close to heaven, even here. But we do not experience it often enough as that experience of joy, because the ego mind says that in order for us to be joyful on this planet, things on the planet have to be a certain way. I have to have a certain amount of money. I have to have a certain kind of professional success. I have to have a certain kind of relationship. I have to have a certain kind of house or whatever. But this is the trick there. First of all, if you think you need that, that thinking is by definition a product of your belief that you're separate, your own personal drama. And... All of us have had those experiences where you got what you thought it was that would make you happy, and after a while it didn't. It was a short-term fix from minor existential pain. But that is because the Course in Miracles says nothing on this earth, nothing has deep enough roots for who you are. The earth itself has shallow roots. The Course in Miracles says each and every one of us has had the feeling at some time or another that we're aliens on this planet. And the reason we have the sense that we're aliens here is because we are. This planet is not our home. The key to being happy on this planet is to know that you're not of it. The key to being healthy and happy in your body is to know that it's just your suit of clothes. The way to be effective and happy on the earth plane is to know that you're not of the earth plane. And thinking that we are, you know, the Course in Miracles says the body was not meant to handle the stress of your over-identification with it. And your over-identification <laughs> and your over-identification with it is the cause of sickness. And think about that. We know that most sickness is caused by stress. I gotta do this, and I gotta get that done, I gotta do this, I gotta get that done. The body was not meant, the body was meant to be carried more lightly. Now, the celestial order. You have an egg and you have a sperm. And things start happening. Some things happened before the egg met the sperm. But let's talk about what happens after the egg meets the sperm. So all these cells start arising. They just, it starts happening. And these cells start actualizing and they start collaborating. And out of the cell division and the cell collaboration, Little brains get formed, and little lungs get formed, and little hearts get formed, and little fingers get formed. And the Course in Miracles, well, the Course does not use that image specifically, but the notion here is that there is a natural intelligence by which those cells are guided. And those cells then not only take the embryo into babyhood, but the baby gets born, and those cells continue to divide, and continue to collaborate, and continue to synergistically work together to serve the healthy functioning of the organs. How do I know? Because you're sitting here right now and your heart is beating and your lungs are breathing. Well, spiritually, just as nature has programmed each cell to collaborate with other cells to work together to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which they are part, you and I are naturally programmed as well. We are naturally programmed to move into the highest state of creative and joy-filled possibility in this lifetime. We are programmed for that. Now, what happens in the body when a cell disconnects from its natural intelligence? 
What happens when a cell, for whatever reason, goes insane and forgets why it's here, forgets that it's supposed to collaborate with other cells, forgets that its only purpose is to work synergistically with the other cells to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism, and instead it says, no, I, I want to do my own thing. I have my own visions and my own dreams, and I am a unique individual, and I'm here to do whatever it is I want to do, and I'm going to get some other cells around me who support me because basically they're as sick as I am, and we're going to do our own thing. What is that called? Cancer. It is a malignancy in the body, and it is a malignancy in consciousness, and that is what has happened to the human race. It is a spiritual malignancy. It is the thought, I'm only here for me to get what I want. And the ego says what I want based on the false belief that I need anything. So a lot of this thinking, you can have whatever you want, yeah, you can, but that's the difference between magic and miracles. Magic is very big in the world today. It's basically where you look to God to be your errand boy. I can have this and I can have that. Yeah, you're right. You absolutely can. You could, if you think about it, you could get that role in that television show. You probably could, actually, if you just think it, think it, think it. But the Course in Miracles would propose that you might actually be offered a picture in a major motion picture by a major director, but you're not available because you have that little part in that little TV show that you work so hard to get. Because that's the difference between magic and miracles. Magic is where you use your thinking to get what you want. Miracles is where you make yourself available to God every day. May I serve what you want. Miracles is... May I only be a vessel for the extension of God's love because only when I do can I remember who I am. Because when I'm doing anything for any purpose other than extending love, then I am in a state of forgetfulness. So then even if I get what I want, I get the money, I get the sex, I get the relationship, I get the whatever, it will not answer that deep existential feeling of pain and angst. Why? Because actually everything I'm actually manifesting is only further convincing me that I am who in fact I'm not. But the embryo doesn't have to say, I will become a baby. I can make it happen. I can make it happen. It is the way of nature for the embryo to become the baby. It is the way of nature for the bud to become the blossom. It is the way of nature for the acorn to become the oak tree. So the Course in Miracles says that your life is already programmed in the mind of God. Just as every cell is programmed to work with other cells to form these organs and then to have them performing healthily until such time as you have done what you came to this particular incarnation to do, and then you can drop this body without any sorrow to yourself or others, which we will talk about. Instead, you are thinking you have to do this and do that. Now, the planets revolve around the sun with no help from you. And all of the things that are occurring inside you, they are not under your conscious control. So the Course in Miracles says, everyone you're supposed to meet, you'll meet. Everyone you meet, you are supposed to meet. Relationships are assignments. There's a natural intelligence moving through you. The spiritual path is the opposite of, I'm going to make it happen. I mean, look at what the ego's thought system, how it describes success. Take the bull by the horns. That's a suicidal thing to do. <laughs> the way of the course is not take the bull by the horns. The way of the course is there are angels pushing me from behind. In the Talmud, it says, over every blade of grass, there is an angel bent over, whispering, grow, grow, grow. Anytime you meet anyone, not only did the Holy Spirit assign the relationship, but there is in the mind of God already the highest possibility for where that relationship, and remember, every situation, the Course says, is a relationship. Now, the way we live our lives by the ego's thought system, it's like you have a computer, and every day and with every life, you think you have to bring a blank document down and figure out what it should say. The Course in Miracles is the opposite. The Course says that the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. The Course in Miracles is more like there is already an undeletable file. And it is the file with complete instructions by which you and everyone else involved in a situation 
everything will unfold in perfect peace and ultimate manifestation and happiness. It's situations which we say, yeah, that really worked. Relationships, you go, it works. Versus relationships, well, that didn't work, right? But we don't live that way. Instead of saying, my only job today is to download that undeletable file, is very different than I have to bring down a blank document, figure out what I want, and figure out how to make it happen. The Course in Miracles says, how could you? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and you don't know how the highest good of all concern could possibly be served in any particular situation. God's will means loving thought. God is love, will is thought. So when you say in any situation, may I only serve God's will, you're simply saying, may loving thought prevail. May I only have loving thought about the other person and the other people here. May I only have loving thought about myself. May they see only the innocence in me. May I see only the innocence in them. As long as we see the innocence in each other, we're all going to be led to wisdom, and we're going to be led to correct divine action. But the ego mind will always be trying to make something else happen. Now, there's one particular religion that has really introduced this concept, that the will of God is not about being happy. And so, a lot of times you live with this, do I want to serve the will of God, or do I want to be happy? Now, the truth of the matter is, the only way to be happy is to serve the will of God. Because the will of God just means, may I serve love today? So the ego says that the things of this world, the whole point is to get the things of this world. And the ego says, the Course in Miracles says, no, 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 no. You should have, the universe is already programmed for you to have whatever in the world would, number one, support your happiness here. Because when you're happy, you're actually, a, the Course in Miracles says happiness is a form of conversion. You are more used to the universe when you're happy. So the universe is already programmed to give you everything that would support you in your happiness and that you could then use. So if you're successful, if you're whatever, it, the point is, it's not like that's the end. It's like some natural intelligence was at work because that's how you can best be used to perform the function that is yours on this planet. There is one function that we all share. So some of us are in the arts, and some of us are in the sciences, and some of us are in business, and some of us are in education. Everybody has a different job, but the Course in Miracles says we all have the same ministry. Because think about it, if you think of yourself as an educator, and yourself as an artist, and yourself as a scientist, by definition you're thinking of yourself as you as your separate being, so it's not the deepest identity. The deepest identity is the identity we all share. Think of a wheel, and this wheel has many different spokes. Now, the ego mind says, I am that dot on the outer rim of the wheel. And in that dot on the outer rim of the wheel, I am separate from all the other spokes. But if you take every spoke down to its starting point, we all begin at the same place. This is the difference between the notion of the Christ mind and the notion of, of Carl Jung's collective unconscious. Carl Jung's collective unconscious says, deep enough in your mind and deep enough in your mind, and deep enough in mind, there are mental images we all share, calls them archetypes. The Christ mind takes it one further. If you go deep enough into your mind and deep enough into mine, it's not just that the same images are you as in me. The Christ mind takes it to the notion, actually, you go deep enough into you and deep enough in me, we are only one mind. Which is why you don't have to create intimacy. How much more intimate can you be than that we are each other? So any time that we are trying to make things happen on this planet, what we are basically saying is, I feel a lack. I feel like something's not perfect in my life. But the reason I feel like something's not perfect in my life is because I'm identifying myself with a world in which lack reigns. So my core belief is I lack. So then, no matter what I manifest, it will never be enough. So the, the mind at one with God knows, I already have everything because I already am everything. You already have everything because you already are everything. Then we don't come at each other with need. We come at each other with joy. Now, the ego mind, this is where it gets really wicked. So the ego has you look around and see a world in which you are just one poor, lonely person surrounded by all these other people. It's very lonely here. It's a very isolated existence. But the ego says, now the ego is the mind that's convincing you of that delusion, that you are separate. And the ego says, I have a fix. There's one somebody out there. 
Now, I remember years ago, Helen Reddy used to sing the song, You and Me Against the World. Right? You and me against the world. This was before I did the Course in Miracles, and I remember thinking, I don't care who you are, these are such bad odds. I'm living. <laughs> you and me, and notice, isn't that interesting? To the ego, that's a really romantic concept. It is so sick. But to the ego, that's so romantic. You and me against the world. Right? So, the Course in Miracles says that this whole notion that there is one person out there that will complete you, like when Tom Cruise said it to Renee Zellweger, right? And Jerry Maguire, you complete me, and it sounds so great until you think about it, right? <laughs> Because, first of all, it puts so much pressure on that poor bastard standing in front of it, right? Like, on top of everything else, I have to complete you, right? <laughs> I, I don't have enough to do, right? So. And what that leads to is the notion of romance, and the Course in Miracles calls this the special relationship. And the Course says it is the biggest gun in the ego's arsenal. And it, it, it's a romantic image of two emotional invalids joined at the hip. <laughs> right? So, the Course in Miracles says the special relationship is where I have this idea, because remember, the ego is the belief that I'm separate. Therefore, and the Course in Miracles says the panic that this sets in. Imagine an infant that has been taken from its mommy's arms or its daddy's arms, and it's crying and wailing. Multiply that by millions and millions and millions of times, and that's the existential panic you feel because you think that you are separate from the universe. But it's like how fast the planet is going. It's going so fast we can't even feel it. We, we live in a constant state of panic. But the world says, well, no, you're separate from each other. Like, you shouldn't feel panicked because they're over there and I'm over here. But the Course says, well, you can't but feel panic. It is so contrary to your true nature. And so then the ego says, well, we'll find one of those beings, and they will complete you. Now, because that is untrue, all that that will do is lead me to ruin my relationship with you. Because that is the ego's goal. The ego's dictate in love, the Course says, is to seek but never find. So it always leads us on this path. We're always looking for love, but it also leads us to never find it. Because it is the mind that always talks about how we're looking for it, but always coming up with the thoughts and the behavior which guarantee that it goes away. Now, the Course in Miracles says that just as the special relationship is the ego's answer to heaven, the Course in Miracles says that the holy relationship is God's answer to the special relationship. The holy relationship is the following. And the Course in Miracles says, you know, we're, we're human, we're living on this earth. All, all relationships have elements of specialness in them. A holy relationship is not where I have an, a special relationship with you, but with you I have a holy relationship. All of our relationships have some elements of, of, of special, and we're all in this process of getting to holy. And special is basically, whether it's romantic or not, I need you to be a certain way for me to be okay. I need your behavior to be a certain thing for me to be okay. And it leads me to want to control you, to dominate you, to grasp, to be a victim if you don't call another time, or whatever it is, right? And the holy relationship is where you realize that this relationship, like everything else, is here for the purpose of one purpose, and that is the healing of the Son of God. Now, many of you might know... Um, Uh, Harville Hendricks' work? Because Harville Hendricks' theory in relationships, in romantic relationships, is actually very aligned with the Course. What he says is that you are led to the person who, who triggers your childhood wound. And then Harville says what he calls the new brain, that the Course would call the spirit, and then what Harville calls the old brain, the Course would call the ego. The ego mind will use the relationship to trigger the pain and the wound, and just over and over and over again. It's daddy all over again, it's mommy all over again, it's my fifth grade teacher all over again. Whereas the spirit will use this as an opportunity to heal the childhood wound. So, when, when, an art, when a gemologist has a bunch of rubies, or a bunch of diamonds, a bunch of emeralds, and they're rough, how does the gemologist smooth them out? Well, either electronically or manually, by rubbing them up against each other. 
So the Holy Spirit, the Course in Miracles, is like, a, imagine a gigantic computer, an infinitely powerful computer, which is the mind of God. And it has one purpose, your enlightenment, your self-actualization, and my enlightenment and my self-actualization, and your enlightenment and your self-actualization, because that is the perfection of the universe. And so it goes, you, meet you. And you're going to find each other. You could be in outer Mongolia, you could be at a bus stop, you're going to find each other. Why? Because you have the perfect opportunity for maximal soul growth. Does that, that mean you will necessarily like each other immediately? Maybe not. What it means is that your childhood wound and their childhood wound are perfectly matched because we heal through a kind of detox. Stuff has to come up in order to be released. But if I saw your childhood wound immediately and you saw my childhood immediately, you would go, oh, no way. I would go, no way. So, hello. You're so fantastic. Oh, so are you. And that will last for two weeks, two months, however long it lasts. <laughs> now, this is a very interesting thing because a lot of modern psychotherapeutic jargon would say that in that moment when, you know, some enchanted evening and we saw each other and felt that bolt of lightning, a lot of modern psychology would say that's just unreal. That was all projection. That was all illusion. And then reality will set in. Actually, from A Course in Miracles perspective, it's the opposite. Those moments are spontaneous enlightenment moments. The soul recognized the other soul. But until we're more healed, we cannot contain that much light. It's easy for me to see how wonderful you are until your wounds start becoming obvious. So it's not that we were projecting and then reality set in. It's that we had that moment of reality and then the illusions of the world set in. At which point the ego says, well, obviously you're not it, bye. But, and that's what the special relationship is. And then the ego says, I will go find someone else that I can play this out with again. The Holy Spirit says, this wound has come up in you and this wound has come up in me because basically, as the Course in Miracles says, relationships are laboratories of the Holy Spirit. It's like this is a hospital. I'm freaking you out and you are freaking me out. <clears throat> Because you're, I'm freaking you out because I'm bringing up your childhood wound. You're freaking me out because you're bringing up mine. Now, if I will be conscious that that what's, is what's happening, and you will be conscious that that's what's happening, and there will be mutual forgiveness and compassion here, then we can grow through this. Whether it means that it would be mutual soul growth for you to stay together or not is almost irrelevant. The point is, if you leave not having learned that, then you will just pick up with another person. And that's what the introduction means. Free will means only that you can take what you want to take at any given time. If that person or that situation brings up a certain lesson for you, you can walk away from that, but you're going to just meet it down the road. You don't, the Course in Miracles says, it is not up to you what you learn. It is merely up to you wh whether you learn through joy or through pain. So ultimately, as they say in AA, you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Ultimately, situations that continue to not work, you get to the point where you are willing to go through the actual healing that occurs when stuff comes up through this kind of detox. The Course in Miracles says you cannot bring the light to the darkness. You can't just pour, your pour pink paint over all your stuff. The stuff has to come up in order to be released. You can't bring the light to the darkness. You must bring the darkness to the light. That's why when you start the Course in Miracles, it's not like, I mean, don't, don't do this unless you, you know, this is a serious medicine. But if you start the Course in Miracles it's, and you're really a serious student of it, it's not like everything's going to be hunky-dory, right? Uh, and, and I remember in my own life, how when I started doing the Course and you're so excited and then you notice that your entire life fell apart. And you go, whoa, no, that was not what was supposed to happen. And you realize that you, you saw your house, at least I did, as a kind of, I saw my life as a house. And I thought the course was going to give me a new roof. And I thought the course was going to paint the house and give me new shutters and dress it up and make it prettier. And instead, it's like this wrecking ball came. And just, you know, the whole thing was just crashed down. And I ultimately understood that there were cracks in the foundation and some rats in the bedroom, and so this whole thing has to just start over again, right? And that's what the Course in Miracles calls this period of relinquishment. And the period of relinquishment is where 
often when you start a serious, deep spiritual path, it will seem to you like things are being taken away. The Course in Miracles says they're not being taken away. You're being merely forced to see their lack of value. Now, we talked about the you that is not the real you, your body. And the mind that identifies with that as you is the ego. But the real you is the spirit. One word for this is Christ. One word. There are other systems that use different words. One word for that is the Christ. Michelangelo is supposed to have said, when asked how he created a sculpture, supposedly he said that he went to the quarry and he would look for a piece of marble, but that he knew God had already created the Pieta. God had already created uh, David. God had already created Moses. His job was to get rid of the excess marble around the statue that God had already created. You don't have to create the perfect you. Enlightenment is a process of giving up all the false fractals of personality that hide the real us. Now, with other people, the same is true. I see you. I see your personality. I see your behavior. I see your body. But The Course in Miracles says forgiveness, which is the practical, practical technology of the Course, is my willingness to perceive beyond, to extend my perception beyond what my physical senses perceive to what my heart knows to be true. Your mistakes are not the real you. Your failures are not the real you. Your successes are not the real you. Because your body is not the real you. And when we, in any situation, are willing, if we make our intention within any situation to realize the truth about the brother who is standing in front of me, May this relationship be a sacred encounter. The Christ in me salutes the Christ in you. Once again, these traditional Christian terms used in decidedly non-traditional ways. The love in me salutes the love in you. Then what happens is I am directing my subconscious mind to pick out meaning because the ego will set up this drama and the ego will assign to you whether it's in a work relationship or a personal relationship, the ego mind will assign to you the role I think you should play to make my life okay. And then my ego mind will very insidiously try to make you into that person. And you won't like that, by the way. And that's where I have a picture frame, the Course says, and I'm just trying to get you to fit into my picture frame. And the way of the Course is, I just want to see the picture and have a very light frame. The Course in Miracles then makes it very clear the only thing to be saved from is our own insane thinking. All the darkness of the world, all the pain of the world, all the suffering of the world, both individually and collectively, comes from this ego thinking that resists love. And salvation, to be saved, the only thing to be saved from, is our own insane thinking. So once again, you wake up in the morning, the world will be training you all day to find fault in people, to try to control people, to try to get what you want that you think would make you happy, thus fortifying your belief that you don't have enough already. Then it will either actually lead you to sabotage the good you have, because by definition, in order, when you go into that mind, you're actually not being who you really are because the real you knows that you don't need anything. It's, that's what beginner's luck is. You know, in Zen Buddhism, they talk about the beginner's mind. Zen, Zen mind, it's very much like the Course. You go in empty. You know, we're taught, okay, you know, you, you meet people and they go, okay, what's our intention for this meeting? Which is so sick because it's turned the whole society into transactional rather than relational model of being with each other. Because if I have an intention for every meeting, what's my intention for this meeting? My intention is always some form of selling you on something which really means programming my subconscious to manipulate you in whatever way I think I need to manipulate you in order for you to be what I need to satisfy what I think I need. It's a very sick, delusional drama, which ultimately brings unhappiness to everyone. The Course in Miracles says, no, I, I, I am only here to give you the love of God and to receive the love of God for you. Best not to mention it. I'm not going to think, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to think it. Then you go into that meeting and you're asking that God's will be done, which means that love prevail. 
And the Course in Miracles says, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. Love is the nutrient. When my intention in any situation is to be there as an expression of love, as a vessel of love, and, and in all seriousness, no, you don't say this, except in certain situations where you know, you're permitted because other people speak the same language, then by definition, you will be led to the thoughts and to the behavior, to the depth, to the meaning that in fact everybody's craving today anyway. People, we are, we are literally dying from the meaninglessness that dominates our, our civilization. And what people really want is an experience of greater depth and greater meaning. So you never have to worry that going these directions is going to make you lose out. It's not going to make you incapable of good relationships. It's going to make you capable of good relationships. It's not going to make you incapable of a great job. It's going to make you better at it because it's going to forge within you your self-actualized self. Now, this Christ self, the true you, which, as we said, that's just one name, the Christ, is one word for this truth of you. And we already mentioned that when you are in the truth of you, you're not just like the truth of me. We are the same being. So this one being that we all share that is perfect, one name for that is Jesus. The Course in Miracles says it is not the only name on that door, but if it is the name that calls to you, you need no other. And Jesus says in The Course in Miracles, I don't have anything you don't have. The difference between us is I don't have anything else. I am in a state which is only potential in you. The Course in Miracles says he has become one with the Holy Spirit. He is a person, the Course does not tell us he's the only one, who has so actualized the thinking of the Holy Spirit that it's like it's a lock. And the Course in Miracles says he has been given by God the function of being elder brother for those who feel called to him as their door is their elder brother. My elder brother meaning he's already gotten to that place I'm trying to get to. And so he says in The Course in Miracles, if you are in a moment of fear, imagine yourself as a small child and ask me to take your hand and I will guide you through this. It's an internal journey past your own demons. That's what the demons are, your own thoughts. And he says this is no idle fantasy. He says, my mind joined with your mind can shine away the ego, which is the same thing as in the New Testament when he says, I stand in the breach. And so that reconciliation between this fractal delusional sense of self and your truth is called the atonement. Now, the Catholics do it as they go along. That's what confession is. The Jews have the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the Day of the Atonement. In Alcoholics Anonymous, it's taking a fearless inventory, fearless moral inventory, admitting the exact nature of your character defects. The atonement is where you get, this is how I've been. I have not been loving. I have not been in integrity. I have not been truthful. I have been controlling. I've been domineering. I've been manipulative. I've done wrong. I harmed another person. You have to admit it on that level of cause. Because remember what we said. If, if my being in those crazy places created an effect, I will not change the effect. The karma will continue until I, I interrupt the pattern. It's, and that's why the atonement is like a, co a cosmic reset. I atone for my mistake. I atone for my mistake. I make amends where I can. I, I, I make uh, whatever the behavior that you led to, an apology or whatever. And then you ch are changed on the level of cause. And then the universe starts over again from that place where you are not reaping the negative karma, as it were, because you've changed on the level of cause. And The Course in Miracles says each of us has a highly individualized curriculum. Each and every one of us, you will meet the people, you will go through the situations. Whatever situation you're in, that's it. And what happens in most people's lives is you miss out on your life because you have this idea of what's supposed to be happening for you to make your goals. i got to meet my goals. I don't have time to 
sit and talk to you or be with you because I can't see how you and talking to you fits into my ultimate goal. And so we miss things all the time. We miss people. We miss loving relationships. We miss so often the real richness of life because we're busy trying to make it happen. And then it feels so awful and we think, well, maybe if I make more happen. And then often only in retrospect do we see, I missed my life. I, I could have loved that person. I could have loved that person. I could have had that deep experience, including situations where you look in retrospect and go, even the professional opportunities you might have had that you were, were a thousand times greater than the ones you were trying to make happen didn't happen because somebody was sitting there talking to you and you missed it because they weren't on your list of the people that you wanted to be talking to because you never know. The best things and the worst things come from quote unquote out of the blue, out of the blue, out of that quantum field because the celestial order, the level of truth is the quantum field beyond time and space. And the miracle, a course in miracles means a course in living in that place where miracles occur naturally. The course in miracles says miracles occur naturally when they do not occur, something has gone wrong. Every moment is meant to be a miracle and then another miracle and then another miracle. But because we don't show up for life and then that's also how we blow it with relationships and those special relationships. If I think you're the one and you're going to complete me, then I think I can not be very nice to the bank teller and not be very nice to the person at the gas station and not be very nice to the person in my building and not be very nice to that person. And then I'm so freaking starved by the end of the day and hoping it's going to be great with you, but you're going to experience this person just starved. Like you're supposed to fill me because of all the love I didn't get all day because I wasn't giving it all day. But if I realize that Throughout the day, I was given this opportunity to give and re receive love, and that opportunity to give and receive love, and that opportunity to receive and love. I don't show up at the end of the evening like, give me. I say, well, I don't know how you're doing. I'm one full person. Aren't you lucky? Does that make sense? So, one woman said to me, one woman said it when we were doing once on relationships, and she said, well, you know the way, Mary, and the way you make it sound, why would we need men at all? I said, we wouldn't need them. We would enjoy them more. <laughs> and so you can see how the Course in Miracles says the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. And that the thinking of the ego is, uh, as I said before, it is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. If you look at the state of our planet today, which is just the reflection of the collective ego, it's clearly not just out to uh, cause some inconvenience, whether it's a corruption of the food supply or climate change or endless war. It, you, it's very clear the collective forces which are all about destruction. And that's because we do not have enough collective forces that are all about love. Now we're going to go into our, our meditation now and then in our questions and answers, of course, we can talk about all of this and anything that you want to talk about with it. But I, I want to point out why we're going to do the particular lesson that we're going to do. And it is 257. And this lesson says, let me remember what my purpose is. The issue of purpose is huge in The Course in Miracles. It is the fundamental power of the Holy Spirit. In any situation, remember your purpose. Because the ego says, is my purpose is to get what I want. And the Course in Miracles says, your purpose is to be an instrument of God. To be a space where the other person can more likely find who they are and emerge into the fullness of their self. But the Course in Miracles says, the teacher of God, the Course says, we are all teaching at every moment. We are teaching who you are to me and who I am to you. The Course in Miracles says the teacher of God is generous out of self-interest. Once you realize that there's only one of us here, only what I give away do I get to keep. So if I'm attacking you, the Course in Miracles says if I have an attack thought about you, imagine a sword falling over your head, but then be very clear. It's not falling on them, it's falling on you. An idea doesn't leave its source. Why do I train myself to try to be compassionate towards you? Because it's the only way I can feel compassionate towards me. The only way you can feel good about yourself is if you consciously try to make other people feel good about them. If you are judging other people, you will feel judged. If you criticize other people, you will feel criticized because this is all going on in your head. The Course in Miracles says one day you will realize nothing goes on inside you. 
And so this idea of purpose is a large part of the psychological training. What is my purpose? The ego says your purpose is to try to make this money or the purpose is try to get them to do this or whatever. Your purpose is to be an instrument of love and you give God your intelligence, you give God your, <clears throat> your resources, you give God your talent, you give God your money, you give God your bills, you give God your successes, you give God your failures because God can use anything. And the Course in Miracles says, some of your biggest failures you thought were successes, some of your biggest successes you thought were failures. And as I said earlier, Einstein said, time and space are illusions of consciousness. The Course is big on this. Not only is space an illusion, time is an illusion. The past only exists in your mind. The Course in Miracles says, only the love given you in the past is real, only the love you received in the past is real, everything else was an illusion. He says, give me your past so I can change your mind about it for you. The future as well, he says, give me your future. I place the future in the hands of God. The ego mind wants you always obsessive about the past or the future because the ego doesn't want you to live in the present because that's where the miracle happens. The only place where God's time or eternity intersects with linear time is in the present moment. And that in the course is called the holy instant. So if you're caring, I got to make this happen, I got to make this happen, I can't be trying to make this happen and be fully available in this moment at the same time. And so being, but once you realize being fully mo available in this moment, you know, the ego mind says, well, I can't do that, you know, who's going to take care of you? And, uh, you know, God could lose your file or whatever. But something's holding those planets in the sky, and when you look at, the, at the, the, the rose, and you look at the acorn, and you look at the baby, there's some natural intelligence at work here. And the Course in Miracles says, when we are fully present in the holy instant, asking only, that we, that we and you, it's not like this religious, you know, it's not like, may I be used as an instrument of love. You know, it's not like that. It's that you meditate in the morning, and your muscles are strong, and then you're just able to be present, to, to love. And that doesn't mean your stuff's not going to come up. It doesn't mean other people's stuff is not going to come up. But you become a more conscious person about handling it, about taking responsibility for your stuff, and most importantly, forgiving them for theirs. If somebody is showing you that which is not love, that's not real, that's an illusion, they've fallen asleep to who they are, for you to attach meaning to that unloving behavior means that you fall asleep as well. Your job is to remain awake. That's what a miracle worker is. And I know you're acting like a jerk right now, but I know you're not one. And I am willing to see this differently and to remember that you're not being any more of a jerk this moment than I was this morning when I was talking to somebody else. And I'm willing to see beyond this. And that willingness, you will feel that willingness and amazing things will happen. So that is our purpose, to be miracle workers. And that leads to our being happy. And that leads to the salvation of the world. And that's no small thing. So let's meditate with lesson 257 in the Course in Miracles. It says, let me remember what my purpose is. <clears throat> if I forget my goal, I can be but confused, unsure of what I am, and thus conflicted in my actions. No one can serve contradictory goals and serve them well nor can he function without deep distress and great depression. Let us, therefore, be determined to remember what we really want today, that we may unify our thoughts and actions meaningfully and achieve only what God would have us do this day. Father, forgiveness is your chosen means for our salvation. Let us not forget today that we can have no will but yours. And thus our purpose must be yours as well. If we would reach the peace, you will for us. So I'd like to ask you to close your eyes, <clears throat> to rest comfortably in your chair, and to enter into that sacred place the golden light wherein God dwells in you. He is not in some other moment. He is in this one. He is not in some other place. He is right here. He is within your mind. 
And now think of everyone that you know. Think of your family and think of your friends. Think of the people that you love and think of the people that you do not love. Think of those that you like and those that you do not like. And within your mind and within your spirit, bow before them all. From the spirit and the truth in you, salute the spirit and the truth in them. Apologize in your heart for any withhold of love, for any judgment, for any unkindness that you have ever perpetrated against them. And now, to the best of your ability, Forgive them for any transgressions against you. For if only for a moment, only for an instant, seek to find that place where whatever they did did not touch the real you. Where the real you was safe and secure the entire time within the mind and within the heart of God. And now forgive yourself for all the ways you have betrayed yourself by forgetting the truth of who you are and the divinity of your function. Forgive the ways that you have hurt yourself, sabotaged yourself, undercut yourself, undermined yourself, been unkind to yourself, and perhaps been unkind to others. Remember that you are one with everyone. All of us are special and none of us are special. For all of us carry within us the infinite brilliance of God. Place your past in the hands of God. Ask to see only the love that was given you and the love that you gave. May those experiences of love come forth into the fore of your mind. And knowing now that only love exists, that nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists, let all else dissolve. Let the brilliance of the love that you have been given and the brilliance of the love that you have given now be a blazing illumination within your mind. as God now lifts you above and beyond the confines of your past, the confines of your mortal interpretations, the confines of your fear-based interpretations, the confines of your conflicts, the confines of your circumstances. Allow the Holy Spirit to release you from that prison, for that which was not love did not exist. Now in this moment, allow the Holy Spirit to pour forth upon you into every unit of your thinking, of your feeling, of your consciousness, and of your body. Allow a great burst of light to so come upon you, entering into the top of your head traveling through your body, every cell drinking in this light, this elixir of healing, 
every organ, your spine, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your pancreas, your abdomen, your colon, your genitals, your skin, your blood, your buttocks, your thighs, your arms, your fingers, your hands, your knees, your calves, your ankles, your feet, your toes, your eyeballs, your mouth, your nose, your ears. And allow this love to extend, this light to extend beyond your body into the infinity of space no longer held in your thinking within the confines of your mortal self. Now we surrender all that we have and all that we are to the Holy Spirit that we might be used for God's purposes. Our talents, our intelligence, our resources, our past, our present, our future. Dear God, use all that we have and all that we are for your divine purposes that we might be in every way instruments of your love and vessels of your peace that those who are around us, who encounter us in any way, might feel the blessing of the sacred touch we feel upon us now. Let us remember our divine purpose love of God come upon us and upon all living things that where there was war there shall now be peace in every heart and in every nation where there was sickness there shall now be health where there was darkness there shall now be light and where there was fear shall now be love. into the hands of God whatever your burden and whatever your question whatever your decision to be made whatever your fear and know that God himself now paves a path of light out of all apparent darkness God himself shall wipe away every tear for you are as God created you a beloved son in truth a perfect and perfectly innocent being let go the rest Together we say, Amen. Richard Lermont, thank you, Richard.
Normally I would go into announcements here and questions from elsewhere, but I think with, with the fact that we were doing the conversation tonight about the basic principles of the course, I want to go right into any questions that people have specifically about these principles in the course, okay? So let's do that. Let's go right into that so that we, our minds aren't taken off. Does anybody have any questions about anything I said tonight and the principles of the course? Anybody? Nobody? Yeah, really? Well, good. Okay. You're noticing their wounds and, and they're noticing yours, but you're willing to work towards it. And the other person doesn't want to and they want to run away. You've been in a relationship with this person. Um, not even necessarily me. I'm just curious. Like, this isn't my situation. I, I, mean, I can't hear you. I'm, I'm coming down oh. there because I, okay. I really can't hear from here to do that. Okay? I'm coming right down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Start at the beginning and tell me the deal. Okay. Um, it's not really necessarily my situation. I'm just curious if you come into a relationship with somebody and you're realizing that person's, you're seeing your wounds in that person and that person is seeing your wounds. Which is every relationship. Okay. Okay. And you're willing to work towards it. Right. You're seeing it. You're like, okay, I get this. I know why this relationship right. is being brought to me. Right. But the other person is like, no, I'm out. <laughs> right. So, um, do you just, I get, I mean, logically I would think like, okay, I'm going to send love and light to that person and move on. But again, is that situation going to come up maybe in someone else where you're going to be able yes, to learn? Yes, they have them? free will. You don't want to be a leg limpet and try to, no, don't go. <laughs> that person may not choose that. And part of you, the issue is always to stay on your side of the net, as they say. The issue is always to practice your path, which is your path is to let people be who they are. You know, people say, when do I know when to let a relationship go? Every morning. <laughs> right? Every single day to be that. You, part of the practice is you want to be a person in whose presence people feel free. Okay. Great. Right? Okay. Anybody else on this specific stuff? Is this specific on these principles of the course? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, somebody has. Yes. Thank you. So how do you feel free... After 23 years of marriage. Exactly. <laughs> I missed it. Okay, so I'm serious about this. Okay, this is, this is exactly why people often want to go be with someone who didn't know you before. It's, of course it's more attractive to be with someone who doesn't know how you humiliated yourself in 1999. I mean, by definition. And that's why the practice of relationship is really, that's, that's part of the practice of, that's why people, that's why children are happy because they don't know what's going to happen today. And grown-ups are bored because we think we do. And that is part of the practice of relationship, particularly long-term relationships, is that I am open to the possibility that you are today, you get to choose who to be today. And none of us want to be around someone who's looking at you and like, well, I know who you really are. No, you know who I was yesterday. You don't know who I'm choosing to be today. And if you carry any of that into my environment where I don't feel free to be who I am today, why would I want to be with you? Does that make sense? And that is part of the sacred. And when it comes to long-term relationships like marriages, that is the issues. People get, you know, you can take, a, you, let's say you buy a Rolls Royce, you buy a Ferrari, you buy a Porsche, whatever, and you take it off the, the lot. You're going to have to maintain it. You're still going to have to put gas in it. People act with relationships too often like, well, I got a great one, now I don't have to do anything. And the, 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 the art of love is to dwell in that eternal newness. And as you, by the way, when you do this yourself, that you are asking each day to be, and this is the real meaning of reborn. The Course in Miracles says you are reborn in any moment that you do not bring the past with you. That's what turns on the other person, too, that they don't know who you're going to be today, right? And that's what is exciting in relationships, that you're going to be, you're not dragging in all your stuff from yesterday. But with the other person, and, and they're not either, but your part is to be a space where they are invited to be someone different today. I think I'll talk to you a little bit more. Oh, I'll be later. glad to talk to you about that. I can yeah. talk to you with your husband too, but I'll tell you something. I talk to so many couples. This is an issue whether somebody's been together for 23 years or been together for six months. Right? Does that make sense? 
but that's part of the sacred nature of, of love, is that we are, we are new and, and the, the infinite possibilities of today. And if we don't apply that to our relationships, then our relationships absolutely get boring. Does that make sense? A lot. And that's the least of the chaos that the ego would cause. Okay, who's next? <clears throat> yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, somebody have mics or Sandy? Thank you. Go, go, go. Thank you. Hi. Oh, <laughs> um, so it's about atonement. Atonement. Um, yeah. Um, I was in a relationship with someone. We were friends for years, and it crossed over to a romantic relationship. Okay. Who he turned out to be and who I turned out to be was opposite of what I thought. Right. I was just awful. And how do I atone for that? Because I don't want to keep repeating that. Okay, so what happened was as long as it was a platonic relationship, you were able to remain sane. Yeah. And once it turned sexual, you went crazy. Completely. Well, welcome to the human race. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> right? Okay. So, but, but once not, again, yeah. that's, that's part of what happens with intimacy. You know, it's not aligned from the Course, but it's certainly aligned with the thinking of the Course that love brings up everything unlike itself. And that's when all the childhood wounds and all of that became... Uh, and you're absolutely correct. If you don't clean that up, that's exactly where you're going to start up with the next person ultimately. Do I clean it with him? Do Definitely I clean you it? clean it with him. You have things to apologize for? Oh, okay. Do I have to... Wow, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> do I? I mean, I want to do it. I really do. I, I don't... Is it something I... E email is not good. Well, right? it depends on the situation. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know your relationship with this person. He might not be interested in talking to you. He might not take your call. I don't know what your situation is. That's what I mean. So well, if he's I... not even open to it, you have to do in meditation. If he's like told you, don't call me, don't talk to me, I don't even want to talk to you, right. then right now mm -hmm. you don't have, you, you can't do that. However, right. all minds are joined. So when you atone about a person, they feel it. So he feels it even if, if he's not open to written communication right now right. or to email communication. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Now, the Course in Miracles says, all who meet will someday meet again until their relationship becomes holy. So the healing of this relationship is programmed into the natural intelligence of the universe. Also, all you can do is your part. So if you wronged this person, you were not your best, you were immature, you were manipulative, you were unkind, you betrayed, whatever, you absolutely have to clean that up. At that point, it's kind of his business. You know, he, he has an issue here too, which is his job has to do with forgiveness. Okay. Right? And that's his. But you can't be, you, you're not in control of where he goes. Okay. You're in control of where you go. I want to do my part. You have to do your okay. part. Okay. And, and the time will come and his heart will soften and we all learn what we need to learn. Does that That's make sense? Right. Yes. Now, I'll tell you something, though. If you go through enough situations <laughs> where you've blown it with a person like that and they don't even want to hear about it anymore, it does inspire you to change. Yeah. You know, when, yeah. when you've heard somebody say, I don't even want to hear your story anymore. That's part of your growth opportunity. You don't want to go through this again. No. You don't want to know that you hurt someone who loved you. Right? So you have your growth here, clearly, but he will also have his as you apologize to him. Okay. Does that make sense? That does. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Hi. My question is about my relationship with God. And okay. I feel like I've been in a very um, determined and um, intentional. Determined and intentional relationship, relationship with, with God. God. And I'm sure he appreciates that. <laughs> It's been my priority, is yeah, what I'm good. saying. And, and any time a situation does come up, like today, several times, I was like, God, I don't, I, this is coming up for me. I feel a lot of fear, but I want to soften or I want to feel like, give me a sign or something. But I don't feel like I always get the sign. I still feel alone. I feel like I'm not getting back the communication that I'm, I'm well, okay. practically begging so for. If you look at this for the perspective of the Course, you're not asking for a sign. That's kind of this a little immature and silly thing that we do. It, it's rather, can you, can you give me an idea, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but something you'd be comfortable that you could share, what are you talking about type of thing that you could share? I mean, sometimes it has to do with, um, you know, the loneliness that I feel. The loneliness that you feel. Yeah. Okay, so when you say, dear God, I feel lonely, give me a sign. 
don't say sign. I'm, I'm, that's a different situation. Well, well, give me one more on the sign. I, the but, sign but, just came up. I don't really... What? The sign was something that I was saying as a hypothetical. Like, it's not Okay, then let's not go I'm, there, because you don't want to give me a specific. But let's say about lonely. Yeah. Remember what I read... Wow, I talked for a long time tonight. I apologize. I didn't realize it. But there are a lot of principles in the chorus, and so I kept going. I'm sorry. Okay, so the cor So when you say, dear God, I feel lonely, let's say that one, okay? So the Chorus in Miracles says, if you'll remember, in the introduction to the course, this course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. It aims at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. So if I say, dear God, I'm lonely, this is what the Course in Miracles says. If once I say, dear God, I'm lonely, I want to not feel lonely, I have now given the Holy Spirit permission to put a magnifying glass on all the ways I keep other people at bay. That's what happens. If I, if I say I am lonely, by definition, it all comes from me. So the Holy Spirit is going to, ma to make it real obvious to me. Some, I'm, I'm going to say something, and I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to hear somebody say, well, she's bitchy. And I go, whoa, a strange gift from God. But that was your sign. Right? It's going to be off something, because by definition, if, or dear God, uh, I need money. Dear God, I need more professional success. Dear God, uh, I want love in my life. What the spirit answers, remember, it's the level of cause. This is all caused by you. So what the spirit answers with is a situation that will make it obvious to you. It's like I remember somebody saying to me at one of my lectures, what, you, this is ridiculous. You're saying, like, dear God, take away my anger, and then, like, I'll never be angry again? And I said, not at all. If you say, dear God, take away my angry, anger, everything that could possibly piss you off will be here by sundown. <laughs> right? And you will get to see that's where I get triggered. And it's simply a mental and emotional habit I have. Because in that moment, based on childhood issues, I don't know how to allow my love to flow through me and get my needs met. But I am willing to be shown. I am willing to learn. And so what will start to happen is the fact that I said that prayer means that the next time the situation comes up that like tempts me to that anger, whereas in the past I went unconscious in that moment, I will no longer be unconscious. So I will feel some shame and remorse about it. And I might apologize. Okay. Then the next time it comes up, and it's a journey, it's a process. And then finally it'll start coming up where I feel the anger come up, but I have grown to the point where I get I don't have to act on it. And then things will start happening like you will find yourself in the presence of someone who goes through the exact circumstance that would have made you angry, and they don't get angry. They had a different childhood. They don't, that doesn't trigger them. And you see how a person who is not wounded in that area acts in that situation. It's like, wow, really? All, you had to do was, all they had to do was just speak their truth serenely? Right? And, you, and the universe, it becomes like a passion play. And you start seeing the things that, like, it's like the universe shows you what you need to see, which is interesting to me because that... What is what the way the Course would say it is that would have come to you anyway, but you wouldn't have noticed it had you not prayed, right? And then ultimately, you know, it's like they say in A, you can th act yourself into a new way of thinking more easily than you can think yourself into a new way of acting. You start faking it till you make it. Like even when you still feel crazy inside, you don't speak in crazy ways. <laughs> and then the next time it comes, you will start, and that's how you do with everything, and that's how you grow. But you know that the barriers are always within yourself. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, who's next? Anybody else? Okay, one more over there, and then I'm going to do the announcements real quickly. Okay? Before we go. Yes, because I'm so confused now. I'm sorry. Okay, yes, real quickly. Hi. 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 Um, you mentioned at the beginning when you were speaking something about um, it's not really happening, it's an illusion. Right, it's not really happening, it's an illusion. Okay, I want to get clarity on that because I can't quite wrap my head around okay. it. Okay, when I say it's an illusion, that does not mean it's not happening within the three-dimensional plane. Mm -hmm. 
the three-dimensional plane is the three-dimensional plane. The Course in Miracles is simply saying, as did Einstein, that the three-dimensional plane itself is but a mortal illusion, and that it is temporary, and that beyond this world, one of the exercises in the Course is, beyond this world, there is a world I want. Beyond this world, there is a world I want. So let's say Jody and I are, are fighting. And he's being snarky with me, and I'm being snarky with him. So what the Course says is that the real Jody is saying, I really do love you. And the real me is saying, I really do love you too. And we have two choices. We can play this out until next week or next year or sometime before we die. We go, I really do love you. I'm really sorry. I really love you. I really loved you the whole time. <laughs> or in this instant, I can know we're both insane, and I can dwell in the holy instant and know that and choose to see this differently. And one of the things that this will do is it trains me to bite my tongue. Don't make it worse by speaking. Just know you're insane right now. Don't, don't attack and ask God to take away your attack thoughts. The Course in Miracles says, think what you are thinking about a brother God would not be thinking. Think what God would be thinking that you are not thinking. So right now, by definition, something that Jody did upset me. Something that Jody said upset me. It might be that it was a place where he was triggered and, and fell into that place where he didn't know how to get his needs met and express his love, so it really was unloving. Or it might be that it wasn't even unloving, but I was so projecting onto him that I interpreted it that way. Either way, it's all craziness. It's all just illusion. Because the truth, uh, nothing real can be threatened. He loves me. How do I know we are each other? But he is identifying with a false self, and I am identifying with a false self. Now, once again, it, it's a process. It's a journey. But you can at least stop acting. You know, the, a large part of it is you, you learn that certain things are of the ego, and you at least stop acting on them. And that's why we joke here all the time, but it's really very serious. If you meditated that, that morning, the chance of you sending a text that you will regret for the next six months is less likely. Right? It doesn't mean that you'll be a perfect master, enlightened master, but it does mean you're less likely to send a text, to say something, to do something that could seriously wound you or others and take, you know, cause misery and suffering in, in your life or theirs. Does that make sense? Total sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do, because we were, we're so late, I'm going to just going to very quickly, I'm sorry to those of you who had sent in, uh, you sent in some good questions, and I was going to answer a couple of these. I'm sorry, I will do them next week. Um, I promise. So, Jeff, would you take these and make sure I do? Thank you. Yeah, I do want to do this next week. Okay. Because there were some good ones. Okay. You know about the live streaming, you know about the, if you're interested in the uh, download of the, of the lessons, uh, Saturday, January 30th, that's this coming Saturday, I will be at the Mindful America Conscious Town Hall, 6.30 to 8.30 at Wanderlust. February 4th, I will be in Concord, New Hampshire. February 7th, I will be in Manchester, New Hampshire, at the New Hampshire Rebellion about getting, ma Rebellion about getting money out of politics. February 11th, Ashland, Oregon. 13th, uh, Seattle. Just look at the Marianne.com. Look at the events page for all of that. Um, it feels so weird not to be... But we have to be done now, right? We're done? The timing? Frank, where are you? Are we done now? We're done. We have to be done. I'm sorry. I... We're... Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll enter into our final prayer, but before we do, I want to say thank you. I'm honored that you were here and honored that you're on live stream. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. We pray for Paul and for Wendy, for Annie and for Roxy, for Michael and for Donna, for Eli, for Cynthia and for Ariana. We pray for Jeff, for Mook, Vivian, Wesley, Johanna, Bryce, Ricardo, Harriet, Australians, indigenous people. We pray for the people of Flint, Michigan. We pray for Joni, for Tracy, for Eliza, and for Charlotte. We join together in placing in God's hands all of our pain and all of our sorrow. And now may we be lifted up. Go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. 
There are angels in front of you and angels behind you. There are angels above you and there are angels below you. God himself has paved a path of light ahead of you. You are surrounded by the thoughts of God. They infuse your very being. You are not weak, you are strong. You are not temporal, you are eternal. You are not guilty, you are innocent. You are not limited, you are unlimited. You are not bound by your past or by anyone's thoughts about you. For you are as God created you and so shall be forevermore. Eternal and eternally good, eternally innocent and eternally free. The crucifixions of the ego shall not hold you. They shall not bind you or imprison you. The resurrection, the enlightenment, the awakening, the opening of the inner eye, the salvation of the true self, the self-actualization of spirit and the embodiment of the Christ light. That is where you are going. It is that that you come from. And in the twinkling of an eye, you shall remember, you shall awake, you shall return. We surrender every moment to God that that moment shall be used for such a divine purpose for those around us and for ourselves. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Be here next week. God willing, as my mother would say. Thank you.